Hello ladies and gentlemen, Max here and welcome back to yet another episode of the GC Informer. As always, we have a bunch of interesting topics, so let's get right into it. First things first is that the Xbox 360 introduced peripheral the Kinect, which also got brought over to the Xbox One when they said, oh, it's essential and you can't run the Xbox One without it, even though they did with the Xbox One S. Well, the thing is dead now, like officially dead, even though we knew it was dead because we haven't seen a game or really heard anything about it in a couple of years now. Not since the S was really announced and that kind of predicted that they're killing off the Kinect anyways. You know, the Kinect definitely introduced some interesting ideas, even though it was just jumping on the success of the Wii with motion controls. At least Microsoft did attempt to do their own thing. You know, and they still have the voice commands that run the system, but it's just a shame that the technology was never really there. I'm going to guess that it's possible, but it would have been way too expensive. People already complained about the $500 price point for the Xbox One launch, saying that a lot of that was because of the Kinect and people were mad that that thing wasn't optional. Understandable. But regardless, the experiment is dead. I don't know if they'll introduce any other sort of motion tracking. I feel like that stuff's kind of dead now and they should probably jump on the VR train. I know that they have HoloLens, which is kind of like an AR VR blend and they're doing some interesting things with that. So that seems to be the thing they're focusing on. It's a damn shame because the Kinect, again, did have some cool ideas, but it's dead now doesn't matter. Speaking of dead, Destiny 2 launched yesterday. Just kidding, the population is definitely not dead. I'm just a little bit bitter that the game isn't really catering to the end game players, it's more catering to the casual players who just want to collect everything, and it's not really catering to the grind, but that's a story for another time. Today's story is that the PC version is apparently banning a bunch of players for an unknown reason. It was initially speculated that these bannings were being caused by overlays such as Discord or Nvidia's GeForce Experience, but further investigation, including claims from people who have never even used an overlay, proved that to not be true. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of rhyme or reason behind this banning, it's just happening in mass. As of this recording, Bungie has not made any comments on this happening. In continuing Destiny news, the popular website Destiny Tracker, which tracks all sorts of Destiny information, including how many players log on daily, you know, the population graphs and stuff like that. Yesterday they took down the population graph for daily players as of the PC version's launch. The chart is removed and in place of it is a paragraph that says, we've removed this chart because people are using it to spread a false narrative of the Destiny 2 player population. Daily unique users is a misleading statistic to use as basis for the active population of the game, or any game for that matter. Not everyone plays video games 24-7 besides maybe at launch. We hoped our article would clear this up a bit, but it seems that it hasn't. To halt people from making false narratives based on the numbers we provide, we decided to stop showing them in this chart. Now, it's important to note that Destiny Tracker is a third-party website, a third-party program. This is not an official Bungie, Activision, anything to do with them. It's affiliated with them, but it's nothing to do with them officially. And I don't know, it's really, really weird that this chart were to go down on the day of the PC launch. To me, it seems that Bungie and Activision may have done something behind the scenes to maybe take this down for now, because as you may know, Destiny 2 numbers were dwindling compared to launch over the past couple of weeks. This is due to, like what I said earlier, there's almost no endgame grind content. It's really just you get exotics almost right away, whereas in the first game, you could spend weeks grinding for an exotic and not getting it. They kind of hand them out the, like candy now, so the hardcore players, they don't really have anything to work towards. Like, yeah, they could keep playing PvP and do their weeklies, but if they already have everything, then what's the point? I don't know, this all just seems a bit fishy. It's entirely possible that Bungie and Activision had no affiliation with this, but I'm gonna speculate that they do. Yesterday, Warner Brothers came out and detailed all of the expansion paths that you'll be getting with Shadow of War. For those who don't know, it's a $40 expansion pass, and it's going to be coming with two new story arcs and two new tribes. I'm going to go through these very briefly because there's a lot of information here, but I'll also be throwing them up on the screen for you to read. The first expansion coming out this November, the Slaughter Tribe Nemesis expansion. It's going to be bringing along with it a new tribe, new epic and legendary orcs, some new missions, some new legendary gear, and some slaughter orcs, which apparently are a new class of orc that are capable of ambushing players at any point 
point, creating a deadly new challenge for them. Then in December, you're seeing the Outlaw Tribe Nemesis expansion. This is another tribe that brings with it a lot of the same stuff. More tribe fortresses, more legendary and epic orcs, more weapons, and more missions. Then in February of next year, we're getting the first real story content. Now, the Blade of Galadriel, I believe that's how it's pronounced, has you playing as Altariel, who is apparently known as the Blade of Galadriel, and you're going to be going up against the newest addition to the ranks of the Nazgul which I think is an orc. Basically, you'll be getting to take advantage of his dual elven blades. You'll be able to use new gear, abilities, combat moves, of course, new nemesis characters, eight unique legendary orcs who can help you out in the main story with new abilities added to the nemesis system, and then an unlockable Eltarial skin for the main campaign. And lastly is the Desolation of Mordor story expansion. That sounds interesting. In this expansion, coming May 2018, you play as Baranor, the captain of Minas Ethel, and a survivor of the city's demise in a new story expansion where players will command the forces of man against a new orc threat to the east. Again, you'll be getting new combat gear, including a shield, gauntlet, chain, and glider. You'll be able to hire human mercenaries to create an entire new army in the new region of Lithlad, which looks to be a desert. And you'll fight to survive in Mordor as a human without the power of a ring or a wraith to cheat death in the new roguelike campaign mode. Now that sounds really cool and interesting actually. Good job Warner Bros. On the fourth try you're coming out with the DLC pack that actually looks to change the game up a little bit. Not that that's necessarily a requirement for DLC but it's nice to see that for $40 players are actually going to be getting a cool new experience. Obviously we'll have to wait and see how these turn out when they release. And last but not least for today's news, the long-awaited announcement of the mobile Animal Crossing game is here. On Monday, Nintendo announced Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, which is going to be coming to Android and iOS devices this late November. It's going to be free to play with microtransactions, insert overplayed Tom Nook joke here, and instead of necessarily managing a town, you're managing a campsite this time around. You're still going to have random animal characters coming and joining your campsite, but instead of just finding furniture, this time around you're building furniture. Apparently the point of the game is to go around and collect materials and then bring them to the carpenter Cyrus. Just like with real Animal Crossing, the app is going to take place in real time, there's going to be seasonal events, you can go around and shop for clothes, shake trees, go fishing, catch bugs, and visit friends campsites. So a lot of the same things you could do in the other mainstream Animal Crossing games, but this time around it's on mobile. But it's also introducing two new features, leaf tickets and friendship level. Apparently, as you talk with animals, you'll be leveling up a friendship with them, and if you get it high enough or decorate your campsite with their favorite items, they'll pay you a visit. I'm going to assume that's like when a neighbor sends you a letter with furniture or something like that, and maybe these levels will be introduced into the next mainstream Animal Crossing game on the Switch that we all know is coming as an easier way to maintain your villagers. And last but not least, the leaf tickets are basically microtransactions that you can buy in-game or with real money that allow you to speed up crafting times or acquire materials and items faster. Hopefully those don't make it into the mainstream game. Anyways folks, that's about it for today's episode of the GC Informer. As always, hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for all sorts of gaming content. You know, we do more gaming news like this, gaming opinions, let's plays, reviews, all sorts of original great gaming content here. Thanks again for watching, guys. See y'all soon.